All right, so for today, I'm going to be um, doing my presentation as a Jupyter notebook. So I have this notebook available in a GitHub repository that you're welcome to look at and follow along with if you like. Um, yeah, well, didn't go to the start. Let me reset. Yeah. So there's a link in the YouTube description to get to this. All right, so there we go. Um, so my name is Christopher Wood. I'm a physicist and research staff member in the quantum software group at IBM at TJ Watson at Yorktown. So I work on QuizKit and also do quantum computing research using QuizKit. And today I'm gonna to show you some of the tools we use for research and what exists in QuizKit for simulating circuits. So just to recap last week, uh, Jay mentioned, showed this image about a kind of political spectrum for quantum circuits. So the idea of that if you're a circuit purist or if you're maybe a rebel, um, the various ways people think about circuits in quantum computing. So it's just circuits are theoretical objects or they're something that you know in terms of gates that you can do a physical implementation of through down to a complete rebel where you say quantum computing is our most general form of computation. So anything that involves quantum co computation must be a circuit. So for today's session, um, we're going to be sticking to the purest picture. Um, so thinking of circuits as some concept of a, a circuit as being unitary evolution that can act on an initial state and perform a final measurement. So I'm going to demonstrate multiple ways you can simulate circuits in QuizKit. And because there's multiple ways to do this, one important thing to keep in mind is that you use the right tool for the job. And what, what is the right tool depends a lot upon what the information is that you wish to obtain. Um, so here's a quick outline of some of the things I'm going to cover during this talk. So I'm going to be introducing a lot of newish tools that have been introduced into QuizKit in the last few versions in this quantum information module. And you can, and the particular classes I'll be talking about that are used for circuit simulation are these five classes. So a state vector class, a density matrix class, an operator class, a Clifford operator class, and a super operator class. And I'm gonna show how you can simulate circuits with these classes, and then also show how you can use these operator classes to insert them back into circuits for running on devices or simulation. I'll talk a very little bit about adding noise to circuits for doing simulations of devices that experience errors. And I'll also mention a bit about simulating measurements and probabilities to simulate the actual experiments you might want to run. Okay, so as I mentioned, a lot of this, some of these things are very recently added to QuizKit. So if you're not up to date, uh, I'd recommend you update to the latest version of QuizKit version 18 because not all the things I'll mention will be available otherwise. Okay, so the first question I wanna start off with this is basically what, asking the question of what it is we want to simulate. So there's many things you can wanna simulate with a quantum circuit, but very generally, I, I'm gonna consider three cases that a lot of quantum experiments or simulations will fall into. So the first thing you might want from an experiment is measurement outcomes, so counts. So these would be the outputs of us doing an actual experiment where we have to measure our quantum system to extract classical data when we're thinking about simulations pure simulations instead of experiments the other things we can get are we might want a description of the actual quantum state of the system itself and so this for example would be the output state of a circuit acting on some fixed initial state and Another thing you might want to get as well is the, uh, the, the operator representation of the circuit itself. So for example, a unitary matrix that represents that circuit, you could then apply to an arbitrary state. So the first case when you're using counts is the typical idea you might think of when you're using simulation. And for these type of experiments, you would typically use a high performance quantum simulator provider like we provide in the QuizKid Air simulators. For the other two cases, um, we want to work with objects that are more directly represent a quantum state or quantum operator. And so today I'm going to show you a lot of tools you can use for those. So just to give a very simple circuit for this talk, uh, for a lot of these examples, I'm going to consider a simple n qubit quantum circuit that can prepare an entangled GHC state from an initial state that starts with all qubits in the zero state. 
So this is some unitary view n here that when acted on the all zero state will prepare a superposition of all qubits in the zero state and all qubits in the one state. So if I want to run this function in QuizKit, um, basically I can just write a short function. So I'm going to import QuizKit. Um, I'm going to import some other functions I'm going to use, like quantum circuit, some visualization functions that will be used later. And importantly, for a lot of this talk, I'm going to import the quantum information module. Um, so I've created a, a, a function here called GHZ circuit that I can call on a number of qubits, and that's going to return a circuit object that implements this GHZ preparation circuit. So what does this look like? If I call this function on two qubits, I get a circuit with two gates. So I had a mod followed by a controlled not gate. And so this would prepare a maximally entangled Bell state the two qubits state. If I go to more qubits, there'll be more controlled not gates. So here's just an example of drawing the circuit for five qubits, where there's three additional C not gates to prepare the entangled state. Okay, so that's going to be the test circuit for the, the next few things I'm going to go through. So now I just want to introduce this quantum information module that's in WizKit. So the quantum information module contains functions and classes that are designed to work with and manipulate quantum states and quantum operators. So in particular, these can be very useful for simulating the output quantum state of a quantum circuit, and they can also be used to get the operator representation of the quantum circuit itself. Um, so th th that's not the only thing that's in this quantum information module. There's also tools for manipulating these states and operators, such as composing them, tensor product thinning together. There's utility functions for computing measures of them. So for example, distance measures like state fidelity, average gate fidelity of unitaries and channels, diamond norms. There's functions for generating random states and operators and also decomposing them back into circuits. So I'll touch on some of these during this talk, but if you're interested, I'd encourage you to go check out the API documentation for this module to see all the, the availability that's in there. So I'm going to start now with the state vector class in, in the quantum information module. So what is the state vector class? So in general, the state vector class can represent the, the, the state vector, so the quantum state of n qubits. So and, and quantum systems, each which could have some independent but different dimension. So generally, for, for now, I'm not going to consider the general qubit case, and I'm only going to consider the qubit case. So the state vector we'll be looking at is a state vector of n qubits. So the output of the n qubit quantum circuit, for example. So you can construct a state vector from a quantum circuit on the condition that the circuit only contains unitary gate instructions. So this is important because the state vector represents the quantum state. We don't want any classical instructions like measurements, conditionals. We also can't have resets. But if you don't have those, you can use this state vector from instruction class method to actually get the output state of your circuit in one line in QuizKit. So this will construct, this will assume that the quantum state vector starts in the all zero state, will apply each gate in the circuit to that state, and then return you the final state vector object. And for an n qubit circuit, it's important to keep in mind that the state vector will be a length two to the n complex vector. So it's an exponential size vector, which is why so you, can, you can't do this for arbitrarily large numbers of qubits or you'll run out of memory on your system. So just to demonstrate this with our example of a three qubit state, um, so I'm gonna take this circuit function for preparing a GHC state and just get the output vector using this function, state vector from instruction of this GHC circuit. So you can see here in one line, I've obtained the final state vector from this circuit. So if you actually wanna get the NumPy array for this vector, you can do that as well. So you might wanna use this to, to pass this around in other Python libraries or NumPy functions. So the state vector class has a data attribute that will return you a reference to the raw NumPy array that's used internally. So getting this, this state vector, I can do dot data to access this array. Now, when you use the from instruction method, you've implicitly assumed that your system is starting in the all zero state and then apply the circuit. So I don't have to use that initial state. I can use any initial state I like and then evolve it by some quantum circuit. Um, and that's done using the evolve method of the state vector class. 
So here's for an example, I'm just going to initialize the state vector already in the GHC state. So I pass in the NumPy array for that state to initialize this state vector. And then I can see that the state vector is in this state. And then when I call evolve on this circuit, I'm going to get a different state as my output because now I've had a different initial state for this simulation. Um, so I see a question on the YouTube asking if we need to run the state vector simulator anymore. And I would say in most cases, no, you, you don't need to. Um, you can use this class instead of the state vector simulator. And that lets you get the state vector from circuits in much fewer lines of code than having to, to call a, a simulator backend. Okay, so there's also some helper functions in this state for um, preparing common initial states. So if I want to start a state vector in a computational basis state, for example, or the uh, a poly X or Y eigenstate, such as the plus or minus state, or the left or right circular polarized states, I can use this from label class method of the state vector. So I'm going to redo that previous example, but construct my uh, GHC state using this from label. So basically, I am going to have a coefficient of 1 over the square root of 2. And then there's going to be two components, a state vector in the all zero state and a state vector in the all one state. And so you can see here that I get the same object at the end by combining these. So another nice use for the state vector, which is um, which you can use is when you do simulations on here, you can actually monitor and save the state of your system uh, iteratively. So if you want to track the state of the system after applying multiple circuits or after each gate in applying circuit, you can do that by evolving it independently. So I'm gonna just take first an example of applying two circuits, one after the other. So I'm gonna apply the GHC circuit to the all zero state, and then I'm gonna apply the inverse to take it back to the all zero state. So I start with my initial state vector in the all zero, and I save that as a variable state zero. And I'm gonna evolve it by a, a GHC circuit and save that as a new variable state one which I've printed here, so you can see the entangled state. And then I'm going to evolve that again by the inverse of the circuit and save that as another state, state two. And you can see I'm back at the original state. And now because I've used different variables, I have access to all three of these states that I could uh, view them or compute quantities of them after I've, I've done this simulation. Um, I see a question uh, about accessing other attributes of the state vector in the YouTube channel. And yes, you can. And I think I'll post a link in a couple of slides. But for all the properties of the state vector class, uh, you can check out the API documentation on quizkit.org for that class to see um, the other attributes and, and methods it has. So to go back to the example of applying gates one at a time, this is a neat feature you can use this object for. So instead of applying a whole circuit, I'm going to import individual gate objects from QuizKit and apply them one at a time and track the state through its evolution. So I, again, I'm going to start with the zero state for my system. And then now I'm going to evolve just qubit zero by a Hadamard gate. So I can do that using this evolve function and now passing in an argument that specifies which qubits I want to apply it to. And here I can see that the state for the system now has qubit zero in a superposition and the other qubits still in the zero state. Next, I'm going to apply a controlled not gate between qubits zero and one. And this is going to prepare the bell state on qubit zero and one and leave qubit two still in the zero state. And then I can apply the final controlled not gate and get my entangled state again. And now I've got the now I've got variables storing the state at each point in time I can use later if I would like to. So the state vector also has a bunch of other methods you can use. I showed how you could add them together and scalar multiply them. You can also tensor product them together, um, compose them with operators, evolve them with operators, sorry, to, to build other state vectors. And we're not going to cover everything here, but here is a link to the API documentation where you can see more details. So after state vector, I'm going to quickly introduce a, another state class. So an ideal quantum system has its state described by a state vector, but a, a noisy quantum system has its state described by a density matrix. So this is when there could be errors um, introduced in a, a, a system that 
I mean, you don't have a pure state description anymore. You need to describe it as an average of many possible states, which you can represent as a density matrix. So the density matrix start class in the quantum infer module has much the same functionality as the state vector, with the difference that it's storing a density matrix instead of a vector. And I'll come back to this more to discuss this later when we get to noise, but I'll just show you how you can use this to return the final density matrix from a, a circuit in the same way using this from instruction. So if I call density matrix from instruction, I get the, the density matrix out at the end. Okay, so that's covering how we get the output state from a circuit and represent the state of a quantum system during simulation as a state vector or a density matrix. So the next thing I wanna cover is the operator class. So the operator is basically a, a representation of the circuit itself. So it's a unitary matrix that I could apply to any state. So in general, the operator class in Quizkit Terra isn't just unitaries. It actually represents any complex matrix on n qubits. So again, we could have custom dimensions. We'll just consider the qubit case for now, where our operator is basically a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix that acts on qubits. So an operator can be initialized from a quantum circuit, again, if the circuit has no classical instructions and no resets, so it just has unitary gates inside it. And this is done just using the initialize method of the operator, and it will return you a 2 to the n by 2 to the n complex array. So what does that look like? So I can just take a circuit and initialize my operator directly from this. And I'm gonna get a, an operator back that represents the unitary matrix for that circuit as shown here. Um, like with the state vector, it, internally it's using a NumPy array to store the matrix. So if you wanna access the NumPy array to do any NumPy type manipulations to it, you can use the dot data attribute to get access to that. Um, and so looking at matrices can be a bit confusing. I'm just using this plot state function in QuizKit to plot the matrix elements of the unitary. Usually this is used to plot a density matrix, but I can, you can use it to plot any matrix. So here I'm just plot doing a, a complex plot of the, the values of the entries in this matrix that I've, I've generated from a circuit. Uh, I see a question asking if the operator is equivalent to the operator class in Quizkit Aqua. And though they share the same name, um, these, these two classes are, are a bit different and have different functionality. So um, yeah, so you can't exactly use them interchangeably. Um, the operator class in Aqua has, has represents different things about evolving circuits. And it's an ongoing process in Quizkit that we're we're bringing um, Aqua to use some of these classes internally. Um, and another question in the YouTube channel. So uh, yes, as with the state vector, you don't really need to use the unitary simulator anymore. You can use these operator classes. Okay. Um, and there's another question I missed. Uh, uh, on the density matrix. So I, I won't really go into detail on that. Um, I'd, I'd recommend reading the QuizKit textbook to, to discover what a density matrix actual use is in quantum computation. I'm just gonna say that a density matrix represents the general state of a noisy quantum system. And it's represented as a two to the N by two to the N matrix, positive matrix for N qubits. Okay, so going back to the, the operator. So we can, we can generate the operator for a circuit, but we can also compose operators. So for example, I could start with an operator in an arbitrary unitary state, and then I could compose it with a circuit to evolve that operator. And this is done using the operator compose method. And this is basically equivalent to if I had, for example, two circuits and I got the operator for the first circuit and composed it with the operator for the second circuit, that would be like adding the circuits together and getting the operator for the whole combined circuit. So one useful feature with the operator is that like with the state vector, there's a from label method that you can use to initialize it with um, in an in a initial state that's a tensor product of special single qubit matrices. In particular, these gates can be the poly gates, I, X, Y, Z, it could also be the Hadamard T or S gate. So here I'm initializing an operator in the XX, X tensor X poly state. 
Um, and so this is an anti-diagonal unitary matrix as shown here. And then I could compose that with the GHC circuit as shown here, and I get a final operator that represents two X gates followed by the Hadamard and C naught of the, that circuit. So as with the state vector, you can also use this operator to track the, the state of a circuit as you apply one gate at a time. Um, so I'm going to give a demonstration of that. Again, I'll just use the, the, the Hadamard and C naught gate objects directly. So I'm going to initialize my operator in the identity matrix um, for two qubits. Say that is a variable. Then I'm going to evolve it by a compose it with a Hadamard gate and save that to the next unitary. So this circuit now represents a Hadamard on qubit zero and identities on qubits one and two. Next, I apply the controlled not gate to get the, the next step of the unitary. And now I've got the, the circuit that prepares the Bell state on two qubits. So again, operators have additional methods. Um, so you can add and subtract them. Note that if you add two unitary operators, the final operator will probably not be unitary anymore, except in special cases. You can compose them as I've demonstrated. You can also tensor product them together. And so we're not going to cover all the features of this class here, but you can see the API documentation for a lot more information on this. So the next class I'm going to get to is a very special class of operator called a Clifford operator. And this is something that's brand new that was just added in the most recent release version of WizKit. So Clifford operators are special because they represent a class of circuits that are classically efficient to simulate. So if you're not familiar with a Clifford circuit, uh, a Clifford circuit is basically any quantum circuit that can be, be decomposed to can only consist of single qubit Pauli gates, Hadamard gates, phase gates, and either controlled not X, Y, Z, or swap gates. So you're not allowed to have arbitrary rotations like U1, U2, U3. And importantly, you're not allowed T gates. Um, if you add any of those gates, then you'll get a general quantum circuit that's not a Clifford. So there are all the gates you're allowed, and you can actually generate them from a minimal set. So any Clifford circuit could be decomposed to be constructed entirely from Hadamard gates, phase gates, and a C0 or a CZ gate, for example. And so I'm going to demonstrate working with a Clifford class in QuizKit. And this class is important because it's efficient. You can represent operators on hundreds or thousands of qubits this way. So like with an operator, you can initialize a Clifford from a quantum circuit um, with the caveat I mentioned. Not only does it have to only contain gates and no resets or classical instructions, also you require that all the gates are Clifford gates. Um, and so this will construct the Clifford representation of a circuit. And unlike an operator, which is a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix, Cliffords have a special representation as a 2n by 2n Boolean matrix and an additional 2n phase vector. So I won't go into the details of that, but um, there's literature you can look up, um, a paper by Gottesman and Aronson, for example, that defines this representation. Um, so just to demonstrate what that would look like, if I take a, the two qubit GHC circuit, which happens to be a Clifford circuit, I can now generate the Clifford representation for that circuit, and you'll get something that looks like this. So you can see internally there's this uh, four by four Boolean array and a length four Boolean vector. So to go into a little bit about the internal representation of these, um, Cliffords get used a lot in quantum error correction and quantum characterization for things like randomized benchmarking. So if you want to manipulate and do operations on the internals of these objects, internally a Clifford is represented in QuizKit by a, a special object called a stabilizer table, which stores the, the array and phase vector. And you can access the table and the array and the vector using the following uh, attributes. So if you do Clifford.table, you'll get this stabilizer table object, which has its own methods different to a, a Clifford operator for manipulating these tables. And then from the table, you can extract the raw NumPy array for the, the, um, the 2n by 2dn array or the raw array for the phase vector. So what, what else can you do with a Clifford? So while internally, this is, this is how you do a, an efficient representation of a Clifford for computation, but it's not always the, the nicest way to, to read a Clifford, but just in a human readable fashion. So the Clifford has two other methods um, you can use. So there's a two-dict method that converts the Clifford to a more human-readable 
Python dictionary and a from dict method that can then convert that back to this more efficient array structure. So what would that look like? If I, if I do call to dict of the Clifford object I had before, I'll get this dictionary that, um, that will describe the contents of this Clifford. So a Clifford has some stabilizers and destabilizers, and these are all represented by n qubit Pauli strings with either a plus or a minus phase. Um, and I should note that if you print a Clifford object in QuizKit, it also uses this representation. So if I print a Clifford object, I'll see something like this. So I see a, a question of why a Clifford circuit's easy to simulate. Um, so I won't go into details of that, other than just that there are algorithms to update the, the state of a Clifford that can be run in order n time instead of an exponential two to the n time. Um, and you can look up the literature for these algorithms if you'd like more details on that. So, um, as with the other operators, the Clifford operator you could use, you can use the same way. It has a compose method, so you can compose whole circuits or you can compose gates or other Cliffords iteratively. So, to go through that example again, um, I'm going to take a Clifford and evolve it by the gates. I should note that the Clifford gate because it's new, doesn't have all the functionality yet. So it's missing a from label method that will be added in the future. So to initialize an identity Clifford, I've, it, it happens that a, the, the identity of a Clifford is also a, an identity array of size two to the n. So that's how I've initialized it here. And then I've applied each gate one at a time and plotted the, the Clifford representation for each one. So you can see that the stabilizers and destabilizers of this class are changing as it evolves. Um, okay, so I've mentioned that simulation of Cliffords is efficient. Um, so I, I'm not going to exactly go into details of why that is from an algorithm. I'm just going to demonstrate it with some simple benchmarks. So to do this, I, I just on my laptop ran some simple benchmarks of this GHC circuit from simulating from 10 qubits up to 10,000 qubits to get the, the Clifford representation of that circuit. And this is what you get. So I, I time two things. I time the time it takes QuizKit just to generate the quantum circuit object on up to 10,000 qubits, and that's the blue line here. Um, and I time the time it took from taking that quantum circuit and converting it to a Clifford object through simulation, which is the yellow line. And note that this is plotted on a log-log plot. And you can see that, um, that on this log-log plot, both scale basically linearly here. Um, and one, one interesting thing to note is that the Clifford simulation is actually faster than the circuit construction itself. And that's more to do with that the Clifford's implemented using optimized num, NumPy code as opposed to the circuit, which is, is using more straight Python. But an important point here is that generating the Clifford for 10,000 qubit state here only took about 10 seconds, which, you know, if you were doing a, an operator, you'd be limited to probably around 10 or 12 qubits for the same circuit. So for additional information on the Clifford class, and also um, I mentioned references to some papers on learning about Cliffords. You can, you can see the API documentation, and there's actually a link in there to the paper I mentioned by Aronson and Gottesman, if you'd like more information on these objects. And now I'm gonna move on to a, another kind of operator class. And this is you know, very different to the Clifford in the sense, while the Clifford's efficient, we're going to go to now one of the most non-efficient methods of operators for a circuit. And that's what's called a super operator. And so why would we want to use super operators? So these allow us to represent non-unitary circuit instructions, such as noise, where we can no longer use an operator class. So if you think of an operator, an operator is basically a, a map that takes a vector to a vector. So it maps a state vector to another state vector. A super operator is a generalization of a map but instead of mapping a vector to a vector, it maps a matrix to a matrix. In particular, it maps density matrices to other density matrices. And when a circuit is no longer unitary, it, it, it's, its generalization we call a quantum channel. So circuit, noisy circuits can be represented by quantum channels. And mathematically, there's many different ways you can represent quantum channels um, in specific objects, such as this super operator. You might be familiar with these if you've read um, quantum computing textbooks or papers, things like a Krauss representation or an operator sum representation, a Choi matrix or a dynamical matrix, 
a system environment model or Stein spring model, a poly transfer matrix, which is a super operator and a poly basis, a chi matrix, which is a Choi matrix and a chi basis. And these ones I've listed here are classes that exist in the quantum info module for working with these specific representations. And you can use all these classes to transform between the representations as well. So we're going to focus here on the super operator class as that's what's used for the actual simulation of a circuit. So to demonstrate that, the super operator is another type of operator, so I can initialize it from a quantum circuit the same way as for an operator. The important thing is that now my circuit is allowed to contain quantum channels as well as unitary gates. And while it can't contain classical instructions, it now can contain reset instructions as they can be represented as a super operator. So an important thing to keep in mind is that when you construct the, the super operator for a circuit, the, the output matrix is much larger than when you construct an operator. So an n qubit super operator is represented as a four to the n by four to the n dimensional complex array. So it's like a block matrix of four operators together. So what does that look like? So if I consider a two qubit Bell state circuit, for an operator, this would have returned a four by four matrix. So for the super operator, it's gonna return a 16 by 16 matrix. So as I've shown here, it doesn't actually fit on my screen um, because it's much larger. And as with the operator, if you want internally, it's stored as a NumPy array, so you can access that again with the data attribute shown here. And because I couldn't really show that matrix, I've, I've used this plot again, just to show a plot of the elements of that matrix. So here, here's a matrix plot of the, the two qubit GHC super operator. As I mentioned, there's various representations of quantum channels. So I talked about the super operator, but maybe you're more familiar with something like a Krauss representation, or you want the super operator in a poly basis as a poly transfer matrix. So you can use the QuizKit classes to easily convert between them. Um, so I'm gonna show an example of converting the super operator to a Krauss. And for all these channel representations, to do the conversion, all you have to do is just initialize the new class with an instance of the other class. So I can take my super operator object and use that to initialize a Krauss matrix, and I get the Krauss representation of that channel. Note that there might be a, comp a sometimes expensive computation that happens behind the scenes depending on the conversion you're doing. So this isn't exactly a free operation, but it can be very useful nonetheless. Um, I should also mention that you can go straight from a quantum circuit to a quantum channel in a representation other than a super operator. So if I just want to know the Krauss matrix for a circuit, for example, I can do that. But I just want to note that behind the scenes, it's still going to simulate that circuit as a super operator and then convert it to the representation you wanted. So if I just initialize the Krauss matrix from a circuit as shown here, um, internally, it's basically simulated that circuit as a super operator and then converted it to a Krauss matrix. So another thing with operators, this is a very special case, but sometimes you can actually convert a quantum channel or super operator back into a unitary operator, but you can only do this if that, op that quantum channel actually corresponds to a unitary in the first place. And this is an expensive operation, so basically to convert from a super operator into a unitary, you have to transform it to a Choi matrix representation, perform an eigen decomposition, and check that there's only a single eigenvector that's non-zero. If that's true, then, then you can recover the unitary from it. So because this is expensive, I just wanted to make the point that while you can do this, if you know the input should be unitary, you're better to use the operator object directly. And so the example I've just done with the GHC object is unitary. So this is one of the cases where I can convert back to an operator. So I've just demonstrated that here. Um, if you're paying very close attention, you might notice that this isn't exactly the same as the operator that was returned when I simulated the circuit directly. And that's because it's got a global phase of minus one at this point. So a global phase doesn't change the, the actual outcome of quantum computation on a unitary, even though it is a different matrix representation. And the reason you might get a global phase different doing this conversion is going from unitaries to super operators isn't a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, any global phase acting on a unitary will return the same super operator matrix 
Uh, so when you go from a super operative matrix back to a unitary, um, the, the algorithm you use for the decomposition is going to pick a phase for that representation. And it might not be the same one that you got if you did the unitary simulation directly. So again, the super operators, like other operators, have a lot of extra methods to tensor them, add them, subtract them. Um, as I mentioned, you can convert between representations. So go to the API documentation if you'd like some more information on this. Um, if you are completely bewildered by what a quantum channel is and some of the terms I was talking about um, for their representations, like Choi matrices or Krauss, I have this review article I wrote a few years ago that is a, I think is a good introduction to, to these representations of quantum channels that you can view below to, to learn the terminology that we use in QuizKit for these classes. All right, so now I've gone through basically five different types of operators and shown how they can all be used to simulate circuits. So what I didn't talk about was the, the different costs in those simulations. So this table basically summarizes that. Um, so I, I've listed the five different classes. I've talked about what circuits they're allowed to be used for, either Clifford circuits only, unitary circuits, or quantum channel circuits, and the, the simulation time and memory time. So Cliffords are efficient in that applying gates is an order n operation, and they only require order n squared memory. State vectors are exponential, so the vector is of size order 2 to the n, and requires 2 to the n, order 2 to the n time to update it. Density matrices and operators are 2 to the n by 2 to the n, so there, the order of their memory and time requirement now becomes 4 to the n. And super operators, which are 4 to the n by 4 to the n, now have a simulation time of order 6 to the n to, to update them. Okay, so to, to just visualize that, I, I ran some benchmarks just on my laptop again simulating this GHC circuit for these various type of classes. So the output state for the state vector and density matrix and the, the operator representation for the operator classes. And you can really see this different scaling here. So the Clifford one is fast for all of these up to, I went to 25 qubits. We can see the state vector um, is taking roughly a minute to simulate 25 qubits while a, the operator and density matrix in that same about a minute time can only simulate around 13 or 14 qubit operator. And for the super operator, I can only do about a seven qubit super operator in, a, in around about a minute. Um, so I, I see a question in the, the, ch the YouTube channel asking about, don't you need one gate from outside the Clifford group to have a universal gate set? And that, that is true. If you add a T gate, you, you have a universal gate set with the Clifford group, Clifford group plus T gate. Okay, so now I've gone through all these simulation methods. Next, I'm gonna just show how we can do the reverse. We can use these operator classes I've introduced to actually insert them into circuits to then run on devices or simulate again. So I'm gonna use some examples generating random operators. So these functions are, are again in the quantum info module. So I'll use First of all, the random unitary function to generate a random one and two qubit unitary to insert into a circuit. Um, and this function will return an operator object that can be added to a circuit using the circuit.append method. So what does that look like? Um, I generate a, a random unitary um, of one and two qubits here. So a, one qubit is a two dimensional unitary, two qubit is a four dimensional unitary. And then I've added them to a circuit, which I've drawn here. So you can see that they're represented in the circuit just as these arbitrary unitary gate objects. If I want to run these on a device, then I have to actually transpile them to a basis set of basis gates that the device supports. Um, so transpiling of an operator will involve some sort of synthesis algorithm to decompose the operator into a specific basis sets. So that can be expensive depending on the type of operator and the size of it. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate it for this operator with the caveat that at the moment, this is only working for one and two qubit oper unitary gates in QuizKit. And for the general case, um, you need to use a different gate, but this will be added in a future version of QuizKit. So what does this look like? So I, I'm going to use the QuizKit transpile function 
and transpile this circuit to basis gates of U3 and C0. And then I can draw this circuit and see that it's been unrolled into several U3 gates and three C0 gates. So if you don't trust the transpiler, you could also check that using these operators that the circuit you transpiled is actually equivalent to the original circuit. So there's various measures in the quantum info module to do this. I'm going to use one called the average gate fidelity that you can use to compare how close two unitaries are to each other or how close a quantum channel is to a target unitary. And so I construct the operator for the original circuit and then for this transpiled circuit, and I compute the average gate fidelity, which should be one when they're equal. I can see that within the numerical precision, this is equal to one. So I, the transpiling was equivalent to the original circuit. So next I'll move to a random Clifford. So there's functions to generate a random n qubit Clifford that I can also add to a circuit. So here I've made a two qubit Clifford. Um, so it's labels printed as the stabilizer representation. And now if I wanna execute this Clifford, I can synthesize it to Clifford gates. So the, the Pauli gates plus HSCX, for example. And one thing I'd like to point out that, so QuizKit includes synthesis algorithms for um, an arbitrary size Clifford, but for the special case of up to three qubits, these synthesis algorithms are actually optimal. So they will give you a circuit decomposition that gives you, by optimal, I mean the minimum number of two qubit gates required to implement that, that one, two, three qubit Clifford. And so these methods are based on this recent paper by Sergey Brevay and Dmitry Maslov that I've linked to here. And I just wanted to add as well that Sergey uh, is another researcher at IBM is actually going to be giving one of these QuizKit YouTube presentations, I believe this Friday, if you'd like to catch that uh, at, at noon Eastern time. So to, I'm gonna demonstrate, uh, yeah, so sorry. And as I mentioned, you can also decompose larger than three qubit Clifford's in QuizKit, but this is gonna be suboptimal. So it won't have the minimum number of two qubit gates in the decomposition. So if I wanted to do that, I need to actually specify the Clifford basis gate set in, in QuizKit. So I've done that here. I've included all the polys, the Hadamard, the phase, the phase dagger. Um, that T gate shouldn't be here um, since that's not a Clifford gate and the C not gate. So the T gate's a typo, but it's not gonna actually be used because they're a non-Clifford gate. Um, so if I, generate now a three qubit random Clifford, add it to a circuit and transpile it. I can look at the, the synthesis of that Clifford into gates. So I can see now that I've generated a circuit that has phase gates, Z gates, H gates, C knots, et cetera. And then I can check that the synthesis was correct using the Clifford simulation of the Clifford class again. So I've simulated that decomposed circuit back to a Clifford and checked that it was equal to the original Clifford object. And so I just wanted to demonstrate doing this for a larger Clifford using the suboptimal method. So here I've generated a 10 qubit random Clifford, added it to a circuit and transpiled it. And I can look at the circuit that comes out of this and you can see that um, you know, it, it's decomposed into the basis gates, but it's, it's a very long circuit decomposition. So there's a lot of C0 gates in here. And again, I can validate that that decomposition was still correct for the 10 qubit Clifford case. Okay, so that, that kind of shows how you could add these operator objects back into circuits if they're unitary, so for Cliffords and operators. Um, now I'm gonna consider adding noise to circuits. So these are non-unitary operations that we can represent as these quantum channels like the super operator or Krauss. So an important thing is that once we've inserted a quantum channel into a circuit, we can't use that circuit to simulate with the state vector or operator anymore because it now it represents a non-unitary quantum channel. So in those cases, we have to use the density matrix um, to simulate the state or one of the channel classes like super operator to simulate the, the operator of that, that circuit. So there's also a random quantum channel function in QuizKit you can use to generate an n qubit quantum channel object. So I'm generating a two-dimensional or one qubit quantum channel here um, using this function. So this function will return it in the Steinspring representation, but then you can transform that to any representation you like. 
So here I've converted now to a Krauss representation um, for my random channel. And then I'm going to show that I can then take the density matrix and evolve it by this channel. So I'll initialize a density matrix in the zero state, apply this channel, and I get some density matrix representing the noisy evolution of that system by this channel as the output. So you can also insert one of these into a circuit. Um, and an important thing to note that is once you've inserted a channel into a quantum circuit, you can no longer transpile or synthesize them into unitary basis gates. So when a channel is inserted into a circuit, it's inserted using a Krauss representation um, because this representation is useful for simulation in, in Quizkit Air in particular. Um, and so when you transpile the circuit, you have to include this Krauss instruction in your basis gates or you'll get a transpiling error because you can't unroll it to any unitary gate sets. So here's an example. Um, I've taken a circuit, I've added the quantum channel, and if I draw it, it just says that there's this one qubit Krauss object. Um, so then once I've got this noisy circuit, I can simulate it, as I mentioned, on the density matrix of superoperator classes. I just wanted to make a comment that noisy circuits can also be executed on the CASM simulator in Quizkit Air, which supports noise. And when you're doing large qubit simulations, the, the, the Quizkit Air CASM simulator is the best way to go for these kinds of noisy simulations. Uh, so I, I see a question now in the YouTube channel. Um, does the transpiler consider the error of specific platform device or general error model? Uh, and so no, the, the transpiler by itself doesn't consider anything like that. That's, that's up to you in how you um, configure the transpiler to, to decide how to insert errors or um, unroll to basis gates. So you could write a function that would do transpiling targeted towards the architecture that you're interested in, for example. Um, and can we run the super operator on a quantum, actual quantum backend? No. Um, so quantum, quantum backends only run unitary gates, but that unitary might be implemented noisily on the actual device, and that noisy representation is a super operator. So we only use these super operators directly in simulation when we're trying to simulate the noisy behavior of a real device. Uh, another question, does the density matrix support mixed states? And yes, of course, that's the main reason you use density matrices. Okay, so just to do an example, um, so if I initialize a density matrix from this noisy circuit, I can see I get the, the mixed state density matrix output, which is the, the noisy state from this circuit. Um, and now I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about how you can actually use these um, noisy instructions to build circuits that we can then use for simulation. So we've been running this simple GHC circuit example for everything here. So now I'm going to make a new function that's going to generate a noisy GHC circuit. So I've added some extra arguments to my function where I can specify an error term for the H gate and an error term for the C not gate. And one way of building up these noisy circuits is as shown here in QuizKit. So I can if there's no, I'm going to use the gate objects directly in QuizKit. And if there's no error, I just define my H gate variable to be the, the ideal H gate object. But if there is an error, I'm going to generate a new custom noisy instruction. So how I've done that here is I've made a one qubit quantum circuit that I've called H noise. I've appended the ideal H gate to it. And then I've appended the, the error term after the H gate and converted that back to an instruction I can add to circuits. And then I've done the same thing for the C not gate, it appended the two qubit error after the C not gate. And once I've done this, I can update my for loop, um, which is cut off here. But basically, when I, when I create the circuit, I can now append these noisy gates instead of the, uh, the ideal gate objects to the circuit. Okay, so now that I've made the function to do that, I need to build the errors I'm actually going to add. So, how we would do that, um, I'm going to build a simple error. I'm going to use a bit flip error model. So a bit flip error is basically an error model where you say with probability one minus p, there's no error. I, I apply um, my errors and I, I just apply an identity gate to the qubit. And with probability p, I apply an x gate, which flips the, the basis, computational basis state of the qubit. So a zero will be flipped to a one and a one will be flipped to a zero. 
And so what I'm going to do is apply a bit flip error with probability P after the H gate. And after the CX gate, I'm going to apply a bit flip with probability P to each qubit in that CX gate. So to build that error, I can use these tools in the, in the quantum info module. So I'm just going to get the operator term for the identity and X gate um, using the from label method. I'm going to define an error probability. And then I'm going to just construct a super operator quantum channel by taking one minus P, the super operator of the identity operator, plus P times the super operator of the X operator. And that will return me a, a, a quantum channel representing this bit flip error on one qubit. And then to construct the two qubit error, I'm just going to tensor product together the two one qubit error channels to get a two qubit error. So now that I have this channel one and channel two, that is a one qubit super operator and a two qubit super operator, I can use them as the errors in this circuit I've defined to construct a noisy circuit. So for my noisy circuit, I just call that function I made previously, passing in these one and two qubit error terms. And I can see that I've generated a circuit that has. So a noisy H gate, a noisy CX gate, and a noisy CX gate that I've, I've previously defined. So if I want to see what that looks like in terms of the original circuit, I can transpile it back to the original basis gate combined with the noise terms. So as I mentioned, now when you transpile, you have to include this Krauss term in your basis gate or you'll get an error. So what does that look like? I've transpiled to the gates I knew were in my circuit. I had a Martin and CX. And I've added a Krauss. And now I can see that the transpiled circuit is the original circuit with these errors inserted. So a H, then an error term, a CX, then an error term, and then another CX, then another error term. And then I can actually use this noisy circuit to simulate the output density matrix. So in the ideal case, this would have been the three qubit GHC state. If I construct the density matrix now from this noisy circuit and plot it, I can see that there's going to be extra terms small terms of the density matrix from the effects of noise in this, this simulation of the system evolution. Um, and like, um, like I mentioned with the other classes, if you wanted, you could also use the density matrix class to look at the evolution gate by gate as you apply these if you wanted as well. So one thing I want to add is, so I've shown how you can build these error terms from scratch using these classes and add them to circuits. I just want to mention that there's also a lot of useful tools for working with noise models for simulations inside the QuizKid Air repository. In particular, there's a noise module in QuizKid Air that contains a lot of helpful functions for constructing um, quantum channels for errors and building noise models for the simulation. Um, so in particular, there's, there's functions that will generate you the, the quantum channel for um, common error terms like depolarizing channels or amplitude damping channels, thermal relaxation channels, and things like that. But you have, don't have to define those functions yourself. And you can use these, these functions to add them into circuits and convert them to super operators as well. So here's just a simple example of that. I've imported the noise module from air, and then I've used the amplitude damping error function there and converted back to a Krauss object that I could add to a circuit if I liked. Okay, so for the, the last section I wanted to cover, so we, we focus mostly on the, the states that represent circuits and the outputs of circuits here using the state vector and density matrix operator classes. But if you want to know about measurements and measurement probabilities when you do simulations, you can also use the state vector and density matrix for these when the measurements you want to simulate are all at the end of some computation. Um, so to get measurement outcomes, you can use the sample counts function of the density matrix and state vector classes. So what does that look like? So I'm going to do a, a, an ideal and noisy simulation now of a five qubit GHC circuit using the functions I defined. So using those bit flip errors, I make a noisy five qubit GHC circuit and an ideal five qubit GHC circuit. And then for the ideal circuit, I'm going to get the final state vector from that circuit, as I showed how to do using state vector from instruction. And then I'm going to sample a thousand measurement outcomes of all qubits from it. And I'll get a counts dictionary, just like you would get if you ran a chasm simulator of a circuit with all the measurements at the end. And then I can plot that. And because this involves sampling, it's not going to be the exact probabilities of the state. Um, you'll get, you have sampling statistics. So I get a, around about 50-50 in each, but slight, slight deviations based on that sampling process. 
If I do the noisy one now, I can take the noisy circuit and get the final density matrix from that circuit. And now I can sample counts from that noisy density matrix. And because there's noise, the state isn't perfectly in the, the, the superposition of all zeros and all ones. There's these other terms. So I see that reflected in the counts. There's non-zero counts in all these other measurement outcomes for the state. So one thing you can do with simulation that you can't do with an experiment is you can get the exact measurement probability. So you don't need to sample counts from the probabilities. You could just return the probabilities themselves exactly using, and you can do that from the state vector and density matrix using the probabilities method. So one point I want to make is, so both the sample counts and probabilities can also return marginal counts or probabilities. So in my example, if I have a five qubit circuit and I only want to measure qubit one or qubit one and three, I can, I can just sample counts from those qubits I specify. I don't have to do it from all of them. Um, so I see a question, how does sample counts method run? Well, it's been retracted. <laughs> oh, well. Um, what it said was, how does this differ from the chasm simulator? And functionally, if your circuit has all the measurements at the end, it's exactly the same as doing a chasm simulation and getting the counts from that simulation. So for this example of probabilities now, I'm going to only do qubits 0 and 1 and look at the probabilities. So this probabilities function will return an array of all the probabilities. Um, so for two qubits, it's a length 4 array. Um, there's also a probabilities dict method that will return a counts type dictionary with probabilities instead of counts. And so here I can see that measuring qubits 0 and 1, I have a 50% chance of them both being 0 and a 50% chance of them both being 1. If I do the noisy one, I can see that I get probabilities of only one being in the one state and the other zero that's, that's non-zero here because of the effects of these noise terms. OK, so I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about these state vector classes and um, density matrix classes and how you can use them for simulation. So you might be wondering, when do you need to use HPC simulators like WizKid Air? So the, the most important thing to ask yourself is that it depends what information you want. If you want to know the state, the actual state vector of a simulation as you're performing a computation or at the end, or the unitary representation um, of a, a simulator, because these require exponential memory to write down, there's, there's generally not that much point in using one of these kinds of simulators for it, and you're better off using these, these operator classes directly. Where simulation is very important in these HPs is when you're actually simulating an experiment. So you, you want to simulate an experiment which has measurements and might have measurements in the middle of a circuit. It might have conditional instructions and reset instructions, things that can't be represented using these operators that assume this purest model of initial state circuit measurements. And even though you require exponential memory um, for storing these states, the, the final data you get, like the counts or measurement outcomes requires very little memory. So you, you're not having to copy over a whole state vector, just a dictionary of counts. And these are exactly the situations where you want to use a HPC simulator like WizKit Air. And just to demonstrate that now, I showed previously how you could use the state vector to sample measurement outcomes from a GHZ state. So and as I mentioned, this is exactly equivalent to running a chasm simulation where all the measurements are at the end of the circuit. But while they're equivalent, the performance is very different. So this figure shows the, the execution time for running that experiment on the chasm simulator using a state vector simulation method, the chasm simulator using a Clifford stabilizer simulation, which is efficient, um, as I mentioned with Clifford's, and then the state vector class itself. So you can see that um, while the, the state vector and state vector simulator, chasm simulator, have the same scaling, it can be up to three orders of magnitude faster to run the, the air simulator if you are trying to get the counts for, say, more than 18 qubits. When you're in the low qubit number, say less than 10 qubits, it doesn't really matter which one you use because they're all happening in, in, in a couple of milliseconds time anyway. OK, so going back to this picture I started with on the circuit spectrum, so these, these operator and state classes are, are, are really for the purists when you're thinking about initial reset plus unitary evolution plus final measurements. Once you stretch out to include um, more real-time computation and, 
and like your time computing. So out more complex algorithms such as VQE or or um, other kinds of quantum algorithms. That's when you really start needing to use these simulators like Quizkit Air. Okay, so just to wrap up, so I, I'll just go back to this summary of the runtime just to remind you that I've introduced these classes for simulating circuits, depending on whether you want a state or an operator. So the Clifford class, the state vector and density matrix, and then the operator and super operator classes. And it's important to use the right tool for the job, depending on the type of circuit you want to use and the output you want, because they all have this very different runtime requirements from linear for Clifford's through to exponential and increasingly worse exponentials for state vectors through to operators through to super operators. And again,